I kind of my legs want to look. Right. <laughs> Did you ever watch 30 Rock? And they give people a mug yes. to do with their hands. That's yeah, what I feel like. That's right exactly now. this. I need a mug. Maybe I should just hold something. Okay, yeah, this feels more natural. Is that right? Hey, everybody, thank you so much for clicking on this video. We are changing up the pace a little bit, and we have a guest today. Hi. So, in today's video, we're going to talk all about. Laura and Laura's beliefs in her training method. And specifically, we're going to get down and dirty with the idea of body neutrality. So before we jump in, I want to turn it over to Laura to introduce herself. Oh, wow. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura. I am a certi certified personal trainer, NASM certified personal trainer. I am a Precision One Nutrition certified coach. I run my own online virtual fitness membership. It's called the Energy Academy, where we work out from home together and we have been for the past three years. It's focused on really simple strength training that everybody can do and keeping it fun, keeping it sustainable and finding community through moving our bodies together. So Laura, one of the things that I love about your platform on social media is talking about body neutrality. And I feel like we've all heard of body positivity. I feel like a lot of people have maybe heard of like health at every size, all of these mm -hmm. different movements and ideas and concepts. And I'm definitely not super well versed in them. Um, and I know that you talk a lot about body neutrality. So I would love to like pick your brain. What does that mean? How do you incorporate that not only in your business, but also in your social media presence? Tell me about it. Yeah. I mean, before we really dive into sort of the nitty gritty, I want to be very clear that like my understanding of these things has evolved rapidly over the past few years. It will continue to evolve because sort of our agreed societal understanding of these things has evolved, right? Body neutrality is the terminology I feel comfortable using right now, especially because of the body that I inhabit, because I am so privileged in so many ways. Body positivity is kind of the start of everything. And I think a lot of people, especially on the internet, miss the fact that the body positivity movement was people debate on the origins, whether it was disability advocacy or whether it was uh, people fighting the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, but really black and brown women in fat bodies, and I use fat as a neutral descriptor here, not a pejorative, um, black and brown women have done the brunt of the labor in pushing the body positivity movement forward. But now in you know the late 2010s, early 2020s, hashtag body positivity on Instagram is a lot of like thin white women in bikinis slouching to give themselves belly rolls and being like, you can eat a cookie because we're all beautiful. And it's like, well, barf. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could, I could vent at length about that. And I don't want to discredit the good feelings that that type of content gives to people because I think we've lived through worse eras of the internet where the way more toxic shit proliferated more heavily than people trying to make each other feel good. So I'm yes. happy for that. But these are really weak band-aid solutions to deep systemic issues. So I've kind of abandoned trying to be like, hey, that's not body positivity, look over there, right? And now I'm like, okay, body neutrality, how do we work through that? Because if people are gonna misunderstand the fundamental purpose of body positivity as how do I feel positive about my body no matter what, then sure, body neutral, let's go there. Yeah. And I think because I don't know if body neutrality is how I walk through the world as a woman and how I talk to myself and think about myself. I think that my toolbox is much more fluid than that as my own coach, but because I am a coach and because I put out content online and because we have to do things like brand ourselves and speak to people from a more clinical perspective, body neutrality is where I end up because to me that feels the most responsible because I, as your coach, don't want to be anything but neutral towards your body because mm. I don't have mm. an opinion on what your body should be or how you should feel about it. So again, people will disagree on what the definition of body neutrality is, but for me, the fundamentals of that are operating from a weight neutral perspective. Some people might call that health at every size. That is a trademark term and that's a trademark term that- Oh, I didn't know that. It is and it isn't. And there's a storied history there. And again, a history of 
thin white people co-opting a movement away from the people who have done most of the labor to push this into the mainstream. There's a lot of sort of internal politics there that are messy. So body neutrality tends to be a good catch-all fit for at least my work and, and what I have learned to, how I have learned to operate. So you work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, and then you also work with people virtually in more of a group setting, right? Yes, correct. So let's say a one-on-one -on -one client wants to work with you and mm -hmm. they do have a weight loss goal. Mm -hmm. How would you approach that? So my first approach with a client, I have several, several things that I do with every new client that I take on to set up the coach, the trainer client relationship from a place of trust and from a place of equality. I don't, I know you work with tons of one on one clients too, but I think sometimes people seek out a personal trainer because they think they have, they want someone to kick their butt. Mm -hmm. They often come to us from a place of shame, from a place of, I need someone better than me in some way. I need someone stronger than me, smarter than me, fitter than me, more disciplined than me to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And granted, there's a huge benefit to hiring a professional to do all of that work for you so you can just show up and do the hard work of moving your body and being vulnerable in that way. And right. Yeah, it's hard enough. Adult life is hard enough. Like, hire a pro. That's, a, mm -hmm. that's fine. But I always tell people, I'm on your care team. I'm here to be your cheerleader. I'm here to be part of your toolbox for how you take care of yourself. You hired me. You are coming to me because you value the knowledge I have and the experience I have and you value what I can help you with. But this is a two-way street. You can tell me no at any time. Consent is, you know, malleable and consistent. So like, if you ever tell me I'm not comfortable with that, we can dive into that if you want, or we can just move on. You can just tell me no. And it's shocking how many people don't expect that from anyone in like a, a teaching role to them, from anyone who they view as sort of like um, a source of authority. Yeah. I would rather spend time talking to my client like they're another adult human and approaching it from a place of education because I don't want to put a bunch of people out into the world being overly dependent on me. I would rather someone work with me for three months and then go, okay, I think like baby bird's ready to leave the nest now. Yes. I would rather equip my client with tools to take on a group fitness class that they wander into or a different trainer or a new gym. Like I want people to leave me better and smarter and more confident and with a stronger sense of autonomy than they found me. I don't want to create a bunch of clients who feel like they have to work with me for the next 10 years and pay me for the next 10 years or they're never going to get anything out of their fitness. So I actually love, I love like a good chatty session when we're like, let's explore that more. But so all that being said, when someone comes to me specifically with a weight loss goal, and it happens, right? Mm -hmm. I work with clients with all different kinds of goals. I work with clients who I know are actively pursuing weight loss. And to me, honestly, that's not really any of my business, which I know is controversial. My business is what my client tells me. My business is to be a sounding board for my client. And the scope of a personal trainer, which Justina talks about this all the time, listen to Justina, the scope of a personal trainer is actually quite small. Yes. So if I'm a member of my client's care team and say their doctor, which again, we can talk about doctors and weight stigma and medical bias, that's a whole nother thing. But say their doctor and the client have decided mutually that intentional weight loss is a good move for that client. How does my job change? It doesn't really because I work with my clients on their specific goals like, oh, it's hurting me because I always carry my kid on this side of my body or I'm dancing on Broadway and I need to be able to do eye high kicks every night. So how do I warm up for that? And how do I take care of myself for that? How do I cross train for that? Other than those specific things, my goal with every one of my clients, my, my neutral goals are build muscle because mm -hmm. that supports bone health, joint health, that supports healthy aging and posture yeah. and autonomy, the daily acts of life, that supports a healthy metabolism, all of that. Build muscle, teach them 
good movement patterns, help them figure out how to move for their body and not like someone else's body, teach them gym skills, how to walk into a weight room and feel confident, what different muscles do, what different equipment does, all of that stuff that it's just easier if you don't have to figure it out on your own. Make sure they're getting their heart rate up so that they're, they have good cardiovascular health. Um, imprint on them the importance of like daily activity outside of our workouts and making sure they're eating enough and maybe if they want to, talking about how to incorporate some more protein or some more nutrient dense foods. That's also the prescription if someone wants weight loss. Weight loss is a side effect. Weight gain is also a side effect. Those are both neutral occurrences. So to me and my small scope as a personal trainer, I say I don't coach weight loss, but like when personal trainers focus on weight loss, often they've got their client doing crazy sprints or they're prescribing a meal plan that they're not legally allowed to and therefore it's probably not a very good meal plan. Right. You know, uh, they're having their client do weigh-ins or do, you know, before and after pictures, which from the, what I've seen and read and experienced are really damaging to our mental health. And that's a great way to make someone really committed for three months and then never step foot in a gym or never eat a vegetable for three years. Yes. So, I always try to veer into the lane of sustainability, of long-term good feelings towards fitness because we know that most adults are not engaging in physical exercise and I would rather someone do something imperfectly for their whole life and get the benefits of that, get the benefits of five, 10 minutes of movement a day, get the benefits of drinking enough water and sleeping. If you can do that, you're doing better than most adults in America, you know? Yeah. So like, I, I'm not there to punish my clients. I, I could get you weight loss if you wanted, but I can't promise it'll last. Mm -hmm. And I can't promise that you'll be happy with the result. And I can't promise that it's going to change the way you're feeling about yourself on the inside. And I can't promise that it will make a certain part of your body look a certain way. So I'm not going to promise someone who's paying me money, something I can't deliver. So I work with people on health. I work with people on fitness. And again, as a personal trainer, my role in that is very, very small. It's programming workouts. It's talking you through them as a coach. And that's about it. And people don't want to admit that, I guess. A lot of certified trainers, a lot of fitness personalities and fitness entertainment content creators want to promise people things that will make them dependent on the source yes. instead of guiding people towards making their own decisions, which I think ultimately, if we are talking about health here, should be the goal. So when you hear a trainer say, I don't coach weight loss, or I don't focus on weight loss, or I'm a weight neutral trainer, or I'm an anti-diet trainer, for the most part, what we mean is that weight loss doesn't have to be the default goal, which is what it is for 90, 95% of the fitness industry. We want the client to be in the driver's seat. If that involves weight loss for that person, which we live in a society that privileges thin bodies that is very dangerous and damaging for people in fat bodies or in bigger bodies. So that's an obvious reaction to existing in the water of that society, right? But if you're desiring that, I also want you to understand maybe the risks that come along with it. I also want to make sure that you're getting nutrition support from a professional who will treat you as an individual and treat you with care. I want to make sure that you understand the reasonable long-term outcomes of that or just point you in the direction of people who aren't going to promote intentional weight loss to you, especially drastic intentional weight loss just because it's something we've never looked at and questioned. And if you come to me because you've had poor experiences with trainers in the past, or you come from a disordered eating background like I do, or you know all this already and you just want to move your body and you don't want to hear a thing about how your body looks, you don't want to talk about your weight, I want to provide a space for that because that's, that's still pretty lacking. I agree. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> the fun stuff. The fun stuff. Okay. I talk a lot about marketing in fitness oh. <laughs> <laughs> and how things are presented mm -hmm. on the internet and how 
damaging that can be. Sure, sure. And I would love to know, because I know that you you touch on that here mm-hmm. and there, um, I would love to know what is your current fitness marketing pet peeve? What's the thing that you cannot stand seeing, whether it's on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, like that's whether it's marketing or just like how things are presented. Can I have 12? <laughs> you can have two. <laughs> okay. 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 I've got two. Yeah. I can do this. And I know I don't talk about this a lot online, but I think about it all the time, all the time. Wait, you I'm know so that. honored that this is going to be oh my God. on YouTube now. Woo! Well, the, you, somehow YouTube comments are the least scary of them all. So TikTok's terrifying. TikTok is the worst. TikTok is the wild west. I don't do anything on there except I post bullshit videos of me dancing and I'm like, no one can make fun of me. Yeah. If you ever see me dancing on TikTok, it's because I just got cyber bullied for like a week and I still want to feed the algorithm, but I'll like, they won't be mean to me if I just dance. <laughs> Everyone Maybe. Like Hamilton. <laughs> okay. Two fitness pet peeves. One, let's say one is more TikTok centric and one's more Instagram centric. That's how I'll delineate. Right. My TikTok centric one is Freaking cycle syncing. Because it is marketing. People think it's content, but it's just marketing. And here's, and I'm gonna try to keep my heart rate low. Yeah, this is I should talk about it. People have been asking me for a cycle syncing video for months. Here's the thing I think that the impetus behind the cycle syncing trend is so positive. Mm-hmm. So I'm so happy that this is coming to light, I guess. The basis of it is listening to your body and working with your body, right? Yep. Amazing. Love Let's that. get a round of applause for that. Yeah, great. Another bit of it is, okay, women, female bodies, bodies that menstruate are really up, underrepresented in the literature. Yes. Right? It's like, look up the invisible sports women study. It's like 6% of people. Um, exercise science is also a pretty new field. So, you know, take it all with a grain of salt. So catering to menstruating humans who are the biggest demographic searching out fitness content, fitness help, fitness products. Um, they're the spendiest listening to your body, working with your body, Sorry, Norm moved and I got distracted. Our co-star. You know, relying on your own internal wisdom and patterns and Mm -hmm. whatever. And then the third thing being being open to taking a break, being open to going easier on yourself and the benefits of rest or scaling back. Love all of that. Yes. Super happy about all of that. Where we get into trouble is when people see those things and they see an opportunity to sell Mm -hmm. and they see an opportunity to smack a label on anything Mm -hmm. to make it seem like it's got some scientific backing. And again, I think it, I think I have to think to be able to sleep at night that it comes from a place of wanting to help people or wanting to reach people and not from a place of wanting to hoodwink people and steal their money. Although on my less generous days, I'm like grifters, (laughs) snake oil salesman. There's, there's no literature backing any sort of logic around syncing your workouts towards your cycle. Your body doesn't understand the label of the YouTube video that you clicked on. Your body doesn't know what Pilates is versus just a regular abs workout? No, isn't that crazy? Your body only responds to duration and intensity and impact and length tension relationships. You want to talk about that TikTok? So when you see those little like Pinterest pie charts that are like week one. That is when we do our strength training. That's the only week we do our strength training because God forbid we pick up a weight, we'll crumble into dust. So we're (laughs) only strength training one week a month and that's how we're going to feel our best. Er, Week two, that's when you can do your hit, which internet hit is a whole nother thing. I'm sure you've addressed that in a video. I have. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the only time you can do your cardio. And then week three, that's when you have to do cycle syncing Pilates and yoga, which are two very different things and also exist on a very wide scale of intensity and appropriateness for people in different bodies. And then week four, rest or walk. And again, honoring the fluctuations that we experience in our body, that's a great thing. There is scientific literature backing the fact that, you know, the five days around the end of your cycle and the beginning of a new one, so like PMS into when you start bleeding, performance is lower. Mm -hmm. We're not getting peak performance at that time. But that's just about it. And 
the exercise science that is done on people who menstruate is done on like Olympic athletes. Right. So they are a fantastic control group because everything in their life revolves around fitness and then they can tweak one little thing and see if that led to a one or two or five percent performance change. For the average person, none of that matters. No. And people get hung up on the details so they go, oh shoot, I, I actually can't go to the gym today and squeeze in a workout even though I've got the time, the plan, the availability, and the motivation which very infrequently line up. Yeah. And they go, oh, well, now I can't go because I'm in week three of my cycle, and so I'm going to unbalance my hormones, and I'm also eating oh. these specific seeds. Like, And I'm open to the literature evolving. I'm excited to learn more about this. I'm open to learning more about this, but we're seeing tiny, tiny bits of science that are not meant to be applied to gen pop, to mm -hmm. the general population. We're seeing that misinterpreted and then disseminated as prescriptive, life-saving advice. And of course it preys on people who menstruate. Of, oh, course, of course it's preying on women. Of course you're telling them that they're throwing their hormones out of whack and their gut health because these are also fields that we're evolving our understanding of and there are huge gaps where the grifters can cycle in and be like, well, do I have the solution for you? It's flax seeds. Like, no, it, eat more food and move your body when you can yeah. and don't overtrain. And then I'd say my second marketing pet peeve is um, headless women, which I find more of a problem on I'm sorry, Instagram. What? I know that was like clickbait. Uh, you can put this at the beginning of the video so then people will be like, wait, hold on, what? <laughs> um, not to cycle back around too much to the way I operate my business, but I'd, I'd actually love to pick your brain about this. Have you found it difficult to market and operate a fitness business when there is no real blueprint for doing it in a way that you can live with. Because I often find myself being like, well, that's, I've learned the advice. I've osmosed all the, all the practical advice that I can. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. Not because, and this took a while to realize, not because I'm lazy or because I'm not a good business person, but because if I don't want to treat my clients, if I don't think it's useful to shame my clients when they're in session with me, and I'm also not going to shame them to get them into a session with me. That feels yucky. Yes. So I think a lot about how I market my business, especially as someone who is trying to be open to all types of clients and exists in the body that I exist in, right? Thin, white, able-bodied, yeah. cis, all that. Same. I don't want to use my body ever as a marketing technique. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, there's a reason that my training program is called the Energy Academy and it's not named after me because I don't want it. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but I went, okay, if I truly want this to be about not me, <laughs> then I want it to be about what I can give you, right? Yes. And I can't give you my body. You don't have to want my body. I hope you don't. But I, if you did, there's no way I can give that to you. So I'm not going to sell that to you. And when you see the Instagram pictures of just a coach from here to here, mm -hmm. what are they selling you? They're not selling you their coaching abilities. Oh, it's my body is my business card. Yeah. Which I made a whole video about. Yeah. It's that. Yeah. It's that. Watch that video. And once you, once you look for it, you'll see it everywhere. It's just a butt. It's sneaky though too. Yeah. Because it's like a quick flash of someone's aesthetics or their mm -hmm. body and then the workout they do. And, and it's, and it's so, yeah. New York City. I usually dance to the sirens. <laughs> no, it's very sneaky because mm -hmm people will go, oh, well, no, they're just proud of their body and they're just showing their hard work. And it's like, if you scroll down and there's a price tag attached to it, that's, that's marketing. Yeah. That's, that's not them. Cause you can show, show your body on the internet. Show, I don't care what you do. Yeah. Right. But the second that there is a price tag or a pitch associated with it, red flag. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we could get into what the high percentage of fitness professionals that are dealing with their own body image garbage and passing that on to people or feel, feel the very real threat of, I need to keep, I can preach whatever I want. I can tell people to take care of themselves, but I mark it off of me. So I live under the threat of keeping my body looking like this so that I am marketable. Yes. And that's something I never want to put myself through. I don't want to objectify myself. I don't want to, I don't want to be 
you know, a pair of boobies and biceps on the internet. Yeah. So, like, you know. I love the alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> boobies and biceps. Branding queen. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I'm frequently very wearing very little and tight clothing on the internet, but you're always going to see my head knit being like... <laughs> like, you know, I just think there's something dehumanizing to the coach or the influencer and deceptive to the audience about having that subconscious image flashing of body with no personhood attached, no yes. individuality attached. And also like it's body checking. That's every what I eat oh, day that wow. starts with an ab flash. Like it's it's uh it's not the greatest evil we have to fight on the internet, but I do, I think it's insidious. Another fun one. <laughs> this is this is like even twinkling your eye and I get scared. No, okay. I love asking other trainers this because I have such um, strong opinions on it. It mm -hmm. is a very neutral question. Mm -hmm. It's not. You know, I have to bite my tongue from interviewing you in this in in kind, <laughs> turning these all back around on you because I can oh, I can rant about this stuff forever. I feel like I've talked about all of these. And yeah, I probably can guess how you feel. <laughs> posts, like popping up videos on the screen, like click here if you want to learn Perfect. more. Like an annotated bibliography. Exactly. Yeah. What is your absolute favorite exercise to perfect? across the board with your clients? Mm. Okay. You can take that any way that you want. Okay. I love, I'm very passionate about a floor bridge. Yes. Because I've sort of moved away from all the little assessments we learned how to do in our certification. The overhead squat assessment? Stop. <laughs> Does that not give you like PTSD? I had flashcards of like, okay, if they have a forward lean. The OTP model, like, upper cross oh. syndrome. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm grateful to know what to look for. Yes. I don't always want people to know that I'm looking for something. Yes. Or to know that they're being observed in that way. You know, I think I've done those assessments with clients and been, you know, taking my furious notes. And then I realized that they're having a really uncomfortable time because they're just trying to do it right because they don't know what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And they're so worried that I'm going to find something or that they're going to fail personal training. You know what I mean? So I, I just cycle it back around. I'm your girl can talk. I love the floor bridge because it's a great warm up move mm -hmm. or it's a, it's still pretty challenging for a lot of people that I work with who are just getting into fitness or getting back to fitness. Yeah. If you do them correctly, don't underestimate a floor bridge. Um, it tells me a lot about the state of someone's pelvis. It tells me a lot about their ability to hinge, which I find mm. is the movement pattern most people have the most trouble with. Agreed. It tells me a lot about tension in their upper body and their comfort with being in an uncomfortable, vulnerable position on the floor. What's that? Thrusting. Supine? Yeah. <laughs> Thrusting <laughs> your crotch in the air. Um, tells me a lot about their connection to the floor, how, how well they're able to both relax and then use the floor to support them and drive. And it tells me so much about their breathing. Mm. So I feel like it's a move where most people have some idea of what it looks like. So I don't need to totally side coach them through it. Most of the time we get to make one or two really minute adjustments that they can feel right away. So there's that nice little dopamine hit of, oh, we really did something today. Yeah. I get it now. It gives me so much information in one move without making them like, stand on one leg and touch their nose. Yeah. You know, so that's probably my favorite because I was going to say breathing, but I feel that, that, um, I cheated. I looped that in. That's okay. All right. <laughs> we have all the books <laughs> and a costume change and a costume change. It was we got sweaty top. It is. I love so it. Cute. I love it. Aloe leggings suck, but their tops are amazing. They don't fit me because they're all too long. I'm just too short. Yeah. Well, I also think they're made out of like, you remember those like finger traps from the arcade? Yes. Like I've put on a pair of aloe leggings in a size too small for me and be able to like pull them up over my nipples. They just keep going. So they never stay up. Cause yeah. And there's, they, maybe they fix that now. Okay. So Laura, you want to share some resources with us yes. going back to the whole point of the video, the which whole is point of the video. body neutrality. Yes. This is not going to be a comprehensive list. Mm -hmm. This I'm also going to try not to make this too extensive of a list. And the 
biggest number one tip and resource out there, which I assume you already agree with because you're watching this as a YouTube video, is the power of social media. Um, especially when topics like this don't get as much attention in mainstream print and internet journalism. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to, first of all, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Justina for more people that we would recommend following for like continued learning on your own. Um, but the important part of that is that you find people who you resonate with, who are speaking to you in a way that you like. You don't need to follow everybody. You don't need to engage with this more than you want to. Um, but I'm sure you've talked about the importance of like detoxing your feed from all the toxic stuff. You also have the option to fill up your feed with things that make you feel good and inspire you and people who are spreading messages that challenge the way you think. So I do have some books here. I would start with, and perhaps Justina can put a little clip here because I keep giving away my copies of this book because I'll read it and I'll get so excited and I'll think of a friend What's the book? who can use it. It's The Body Is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Great, which editing, I didn't, right there. That to me is a great primer if you are looking to engage with this work for yourself. It's a little bit woo-woo, which I love. It's very like soft and personal, um, and it's deeply approachable in a way that it doesn't get too heavily political as some of these will. Um, but even if you're not really into fitness, which I don't know how you ended up here, but I think that's a book that everyone should read and that everyone would get something out of. So I would start there. If you engage with that book and you like that book, there are two places that I would go. Uh, if you want more practical advice, if you are looking at this from a, how do I apply this to my fitness practice perspective, The Body Liberation Project by Chrissy King, who is, this is there we go. I'll put my QVC, QVC skills to the test. Perfect. Um, Chrissy King, wonderful person. I believe she refers to herself as a wellness personality, but she was a strength coach, so that's the background that she comes from. This book just dropped, so I'm admittedly only about a Ooh. chapter in, but I trust Chrissy implicitly. And this is a very approachable book. I think this actually fills a huge gap in the literature between not being afraid to lean into the political side of things, but also being practical, full of like advice that you can actually use in your life as a person and not just, you know, theory. Uh, so go there. If you are more interested in the political bent of things and you like history and you're really intent on understanding the root of all of this, Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia by Dr. Sabrina Strings. She's selling herself short on this cover here. This is a life and mind changing read. I don't think you know, I don't think your aunt at the Thanksgiving dinner table is ready to dive into this one right away, which is why I recommend the others first. But this is, this is a book that I can point to as clicking so many things into place with me. This is a book I cite all the time and it's a fascinating read. It's also very readable and very approachable, but it is, you know, this is not step one for most people. Right. Um, if you like this, and you want more, this book, uh, Belly of the Beast, The Politics of Anti-Fatness as Anti-Blackness by Deshaun L. Harrison. This is the child of fearing the black body and the body is not an apology. So this is the next step in your quest. This is a fabulous book. I'm gonna move through these quicker. Uh, also engage with the work of Aubrey Gordon, who you might know on Instagram as your fat friend. Uh, she also co-hosts the amazing podcast, Maintenance Phase with um, Michael Hobbs. That's another great place to start. That's a very friendly, fun, mm -hmm. entertaining entry point because this work gets heavy. You know, all of these topics get, get uh, deep and emotionally taxing. But what we don't talk about when we talk about fat, and then she just released a second book that Justine will put in the comments because I, I think it's something, it's like 19 myths about fat yeah, people. I, I have it in there, but I haven't cracked it open yet. <laughs> um, but Aubrey is also has a ton of free published work online. So if you don't want to buy the book, although buy the book and support her, but you can also start there and read some of her essays. I learn a lot from Aubrey Gordon, highly suggest. Um, and then this is a book, Laura Kudari is actually Queens based, I believe. Oh, I this one. She's a amazing trainer, power lifter, I believe. There are some glaring omissions from this pile that have been omitted for various reasons. My understanding of their authorship or the impact of platforming those people has evolved. So there are books that have been in the stack that I've taken out. This is a book that I would put on your reading list if you're interested in 
trauma and how it affects our bodies, the trauma of having a body, um, how fitness and strength training specifically can be empowering. And there are so many practical tips in there. There are lots of journaling prompts and ways to engage with the book past just reading it. This is a great primer on moving your body tenderly and with consideration for like the things that might be living in your body because of your experiences as a person. So that's where I would start. Or to wrap it up, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you? Well, uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere on the internet. I'm here on YouTube at laura.gerard. I'm on Instagram at laura.gerard, same handle. I'm on TikTok at LC Gerard, which was a terrible branding mistake on my part. I co-host a podcast with the amazing Carolyn Vig that's called Fit Literate. You can find us wherever podcasts are sold. Uh, and obviously, if you're interested in joining my online membership, you can check out the Energy Academy. And the best way to find that is to link through my Instagram, YouTube, any of those places where links are sold. Yeah. Oh, look at this beautiful This is Norman. Child. Oh God, he's gonna kill me. <laughs> gonna kill me. <laughs> Come here. Come here. Okay, just real quick. Cooperate real quick. This is Norman. Hi, Norm. He's a very good boy, and he's not usually camera shy. And he's wow. got a very good belly. Okay, All you right, can go now. Best. You did a great job. <sighs> a for effort. Well, maybe not. <laughs>